delighted to welcome to This Week in Virginia, Secretary Atif Carney, Secretary of Education, uh, a, a teacher, first public school teacher to be named as a Secretary of Education in the Commonwealth, and maybe not the first Marine, but um, someone who is a Marine Sergeant, a great deal of experience, and, and now um, finishing up the third year, soon moving into the fourth year as Secretary of Education. And Secretary Carney, we, we welcome you and would like to in, invite you to first, before we talk education, Secretary of Education issues, to, to, to talk about uh, the unusual election experience. Uh, if you had been in the classroom teaching civics or U.S. history, uh, what would it have been like during this last three weeks? Uh, David, that's a great question. And I, I know I would have really enjoyed teaching lessons about this because there's a lot you can dig into. It's not just about the ele election process and the electoral college, but looking it into our constitution and our laws. And uh, there's a lot of uh, fun, neat, uh, interactive discussions that would occur. So I remember actually in 2016 when the presidential election was going on, uh, my students uh, every year in my civics classes, they participated uh, in a mock election uh, and actually we actually had folks um, from our uh, state board of elections and the League of Women Voters would come in and actually run an election for the students. But in uh, order to vote uh, before that, uh, there was a lot of preparation that I had a multiple lessons where students would do a lot of research and we would have uh, uh, observed all the debates from the candidates and did a, a lot of review of their policies. Um, but this is a very exciting time, uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, whenever we have elections. So as a teacher, I can only imagine what teachers are uh, doing, um, whether it's in virtual settings or in person settings. Most of our students obviously are in virtual settings. My son, who's taken a U.S. government class, uh, he's in high school this year. Um, uh, he's a senior. I know that they're having very robust conversations uh, and he has been so very engaged in the election process even after the election was done. So um, it's very exciting. So I'm, I'm really missing the classroom. I, uh, you know, really uh, found it exciting around election times uh, to conduct a lot of interactive lessons, but especially with this historic election, there's a lot of neat activities uh, that I'm certain a lot of teachers are doing uh, to engage their students. I can imagine some of those conversations that your son would be involved in. And, and as one who had some experience a long time ago teaching U.S. history in a junior college setting, um, it's not just the pandemic that we're going through, but we're, we're going through the most unusual three weeks and maybe going into four uh, uh, of a time, after, three weeks after an election, in which now, just now, uh, the, the president-elect is getting some office space and things are starting to open up. But uh, we, we could be looking at a time in January with the president sworn in in which the incumbent uh, never really conceded. And, and that, that uh, the, the pandemic and the toll on lives is so much more critical and, and lasting, but it's uh, quite quite a time for students to be going through and teachers too uh, in this 2020 post-election days. And, and one thing I, um, uh, you know, we're going through this very tough time in the pandemic and at a very divisive times in our nation. Um, and there's been a lot of conversations about disruption in instruction because, you know, the um, vast majority of our students are learning virtually and so forth. But it's a learning experience because what generation can say that they went through this um, time? And I think long term, it would really build a lot of resiliency. And I'm seeing that even not only in my children, but uh, children of my friends. And when I do virtual classrooms and so forth, um, it's a very strong, powerful learning experience for our young people. Uh, that they're going through, whether it's K-12 settings or um, higher education settings, that I think they will come out of this more resilient and even stronger. Uh, switch over to your day job now as Secretary of Education and, and tell us what, 
how are the teachers faring? I know that you're in contact with them and they're in contact with you. Uh, the, the students may come out of this and I have a grandson who may talk about this in generations to come, but the, the teachers, the, the counselors, the, the, the staff in some of the schools uh, where maybe they're being hybrid or they're being virtual, it's, it's an experience for them that they have never had before. They have not. And, and, and it's not an easy experience. It's been very tough. Um, I speak to teachers um, almost every day uh, because, you know, almost all my friends are teachers. Um, uh, so I talk to them directly and other uh, teachers that I've uh, come to know over the last three years. As a matter of fact, I got several calls um, last night. I was talking to some teachers from uh, um, different school divisions uh, in Northern Virginia uh, as they're thinking through um, uh, putting a hold to some of the, the in-person uh, settings and progress and so forth. So it's been very tough on them. And uh, uh, unfortunately, um, with the pandemic, because everybody's really stressed out, families are stressed out and teachers are stressed out, um, sometimes, you know, we become a little too short in our conversations, on, especially on social media. And I just remind everyone is to please be graceful and and think about that everybody's going through a tough time. We're all in this together and we all have different situations that we're dealing with, including folks who are making decisions, the school board members and superintendents. They're not under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. And we just have to show empathy with our teachers. Um, we have to show empathy that it's not easy adjusting to virtual settings. Uh, they're spending a lot more time uh, preparing lessons and activities to engage students. Um, it's not the case where folks are like, hey, I just want to sit and relax at home. That's not the case. Our school counselors, I talk to a lot of them, as you know, David, they're uh, looking for innovative and creative ways to really provide the social emotional supports and mental health services and academic services to their students in more creative ways. Um, so it creates a lot of pressure and stress. And then for our families, too, is that we have to be really empathetic. Our families are going through a very tough time. Our families who have students with special needs, um, uh, they, I, I talk to them often. I have a lot of parents who um, have actually they're broken down in tears uh, because they're really worried about the social emotional well-being of their children too and the impact that the pandemic is having. So um, we're all thinking through this together. One request I would have is just for everyone just to really uh, be empathetic to everybody you know, uh, buddy else and be understanding. Um, and I'm optimistic because we've been, we're eight months into this pandemic, but you know, um, uh, we're a resilient society. Um, hopefully, I'm cautiously optimistic that we'll have a vaccine here soon and we'll come out of this, uh, get through this pandemic. Um, uh, so um, uh, just my request is to you know, hang in there and, and, and really keep everybody else in mind, um, uh, you know, especially our, 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 our educators who are really are passionate and really care about our children. <clears throat> you know, when you mentioned the vaccine, yes, the, the news continues to be good with uh, already three that are showing real promise and maybe one or two of them will be available very soon. Um, I'm, uh, I'm wondering if there's a pecking order of, of who gets the vaccine that finally gets down to, to teachers who are in in school settings. I, I know I've heard from the governor and we hear from other governors around the states that uh, we'll start with the healthcare people and then it moves to public safety and, and moves to the ones, I guess, in, in nursing home type settings. And I wonder if, if that list uh, soon after that gets on down to the ones who are 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 actually the, the front line teachers who are in schools that, that are open? Thank you, David. That's a great question. And we're definitely starting to think through those decisions. And um, when the vaccine is starting to get socialized, you know, who gets it? And also about a policy, you know, what um, do we require it um, or not? It's going to be a big conversation, say, for every student coming back, every um, uh, teacher and staff coming back. And so those policy discussions we're starting to think through. Um, there'll be a lot of thought, uh, thoughtful um, uh, ideas will be put, you know, uh, taken into account before making those decisions. And a lot of people will be making those decisions. Uh, the governor will seek advice from a lot of health experts as he has in the pandemic. He will 
consult with the General Assembly leadership and his administration. So um, I know that this is something on his mind and he thinks about this every day. He wants to be very, very thoughtful about the entire process during the pandemic. <clears throat> You know, it would be hopeful, even as we're, we're hoping and now we're starting to see some results with vaccines being available, that that since they came about in the closing days and weeks of the Trump administration, and since it will be the Biden administration that will be ministering it, hopefully that major divide that you spoke of that we have in, in America right now, that's a political divide, that we will we will have people who will be receptive to the vaccine. If, if it had been not coming about, I would just speculate if the vaccine had been next February coming about, that there might have been some people who really support President Trump and wish he'd been reelected would have questions about it. But uh, hopefully, when it's available, uh, we as a population will be, be willing to accept it to uh, not just to protect ourselves, but to hopefully to protect other people. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, that's an individual decision a lot of people will have to make. We certainly, um, in this pandemic, um, uh, the divisiveness is um, really worsened. And we want to start, like I said, mentioned earlier, is be graceful, try to think of all different perspectives, uh, look at the whole society as uh, holistically and putting self-interest aside and just looking at the greater good um, and, and uh, make the decisions um, and I know you didn't ask this question, but with Thanksgiving um, and holidays coming up and Christmas break will be coming up in, a, in about a month or so, um, we uh, often let our guard down when we were with family and friends. So we want to be thoughtful about the pandemic is still here. It's very real. Um, and we want to make sure that we make good, smart decisions um, uh, collectively um, to really contain the pandemic and then even when we're having those discussions about vaccination and so forth, we want to just make thoughtful decisions um, uh, uh, to um, get beyond this pandemic. <clears throat> I'll, I'll let our viewers know that we're having a conversation on Tuesday, just two days before Thanksgiving and around the, the country, there's excited students who will be returning from colleges and universities. And then there's anxiety too about whether they maybe even as asymptomatic, whether they will be bringing the virus into their family, into their neighborhood. So it, it is a time of, of real concern and a, a time that, that to some degree puts some damper onto Thanksgiving. But as any number of people keep saying that we get through this Thanksgiving so that we can really celebrate another one in 2021. And, and we, we keep our guard up this time. Absolutely. And we will, we were, or, you know, we have to stay resilient. We will get through this. We are um, history, being a history teacher and stuff. And, you know, right. both of us, she bops, we, um, and as uh, Americans have gone through a lot of tough times and uh, our resiliency, our uh, faith in each other has really um, uplifted all of us and we've come out of it stronger and better. So we will get through this uh, trying time as well. <clears throat> You know, when the governor's in a news conference or whenever he's speaking, he talks about the, the great diversity in the Commonwealth and growing up on the Eastern Shore as he did and, and his knowledge of the Commonwealth from way out in Lee County, it's, it's, it's different than it is in some of the major urban areas or even different than, than it was in Prince William where, where you, you taught. Um, as, you, as you look at the Commonwealth as a whole and thinking about what's happening, uh, are, are we right in thinking that it's in more of the rural areas where s schools are open and and if they are closed, it tends to be more in a area where there's great population in an urban area? Um, That's generally the trend is that um, if you think about it, uh, it's not uh, necessarily because of political beliefs and so forth. And that does have an impact, but it is because of the size of the schools right. and the school divisions where in rural settings uh, generally... Uh, school divisions, the population is much smaller, so they can do the social distancing with fidelity uh, much easier um, on what the space they have available as opposed to more populated school divisions. Um, so that has played a big role in deciding what kind of in-person to do and how rapidly to do that. Um, so that definitely plays a big role. 
you know, I think our, our viewers have enjoyed that very unique scene behind you. And they can read the top part. Uh, and then it says something about it's cool. Is it cool to be kind or what is yes, the... Yes, yeah, it's cool to be kind. I know uh, uh, we as teachers use a lot of these cheesy phrases, but it's, you know, it's meaningful <laughs> stuff. So, yes, that's what it says. Right, right. Well, Secretary Carney, uh, if you shift your focus before our time would expire here in this show to the upcoming session. Um, who, who knows whether it's 30 days or 46 days or who knows what will be happening, but we know there will be a session that convenes January 13th. We know that I believe December 16th, the governor will be um, unveiling, introducing his proposed budget amendments uh, to the joint money committees and to the then to the general public, uh, what what comments do you have as you as you think about the upcoming session? Yeah, um, definitely COVID uh, the nineteen pandemic is on top of our minds to think through that we're um, uh, being thoughtful and we try to be as thoughtful as possible with with funding and any kind of policy decisions. So that will be the top priority still. Um, and then, um, if you recall, um, there was a lot of um, progress we made, uh, both in the policy and budgetary spaces, um, uh, not only in education, but in healthcare and in uh, housing. Right. And, uh, so um, the, we're going to look at some of the items that were um, uh, frozen or unallotted um, to see if we can restore um, as much of that as possible, depending on the economic outlook. So those are the two big bucket items that will be. Will I know that everybody's thinking through and is on their minds, but um, definitely uh, uh, the pandemic and issues dealing with that would be the top priority. <clears throat> and the the work that is going on in the cabinet and by the governor on the budget has got to be a tremendous challenge because we're. In some ways, around the nation is waiting, and, and states and cities are waiting to see, uh, will there be some other relief that will be coming from Congress before the end of 2020? Uh, we, we have heard and we know that funds that the states have received, uh, unless it's changed, have some requirement that they be spent by December, the end of December in 2020. So there's I guess even the possibility they might lift that and not require every dollar to be spent if if it some of it maybe is better spent in the early part of January, but but the the hopes that the two parties will come together, President Trump has made every indication that he would support some additional relief that would come to states to get out to local governments, and so it's. Uh, all of that being in play and the upcoming budget time really makes it a challenge in education and in other areas to figure out just what, what can you do? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we definitely want uh, need more resources and dollars um, and more flexibility. Um, we've done a pretty good job as, as a state, um, collectively the General Assembly and the, uh, the governor working in collaboration with the local uh, localities to uh, take the CARES Act dollars and flow them as smoothly as possible, but uh, more more help is needed uh, from the federal government, and definitely uh, more flexibility is uh, would help go go a long way as well. Well, Secretary Carney, before we would uh, conclude the time, what other message would you want to get out to people around around the Commonwealth, to uh, whether they're teachers or whether they're parents of school-aged children, or whether they are ones like your son who will have an opportunity to, to see this. What, uh, what's your message here toward the end of 2020? Yeah, the, my message um, is that we've, um, it's been a tough year with the pandemic, um, with the political climate that we're dealing with, um, uh, so uh, as the year is coming to an end, as and as we have an opportunity uh, over Thanksgiving holiday or whether it's uh, winter holidays with Christmas break, um, uh, we all take a time to reflect. Uh, it's a good time to reflect and um, 
uh, think about how we interact with others, uh, show more grace, um, show more empathy and compassion, um, and really prioritize um, our, uh, our safety um, as well and safety of others. It's really important to make good decisions so we can contain the pandemic as best as possible. And then also think about the social emotional supports um, you know, we might need or others might need. Uh, and just uh, even though we're in a physically distant world, that does not mean that we can't stay connected virtually. And we do our best to connect, stay connected uh, with each other virtually and provide the social emotional support. Um, and I just wanna wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Secretary Carney, thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, talking with you again and seeing you if not in 2020, certainly in the early part of 2021. So thank you, and you have a good Thanksgiving too. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Vince.